Well, hello YouTube, it's me, Fortmaster, and welcome to something new. Well, yeah, sort of something new. Uh, today, I'm going to be reacting to Windy Goon's The Mystery of Vincent Van Gogh's Death. And the reason why I'm reacting to this, because uh, Internet Historian suggested that, you know, people who watched his um, fancy uh, video about painting uh, watch uh, Windy Goon's... No, Wendy Goon's video up going into Van Gogh further. Funny thing, I've heard of Wendy Goon just not in a long time. I, I I don't remember where I've like seen him before or what videos of his I've seen before, but I remember his face and I remember the sound of his voice. So yeah, without further ado, uh, let's actually get into this and learn some more about Van Gogh because um, I'm pretty sure anybody with even just a very passing knowledge of Van Gogh knows that he was a, um, and he had an interesting life, let's just put it that way. <laughs> so as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen that for some reason. Corner video will lead to my Let's Play of the Day, and with all that out of the way, let's get this thing started then, shall we? Hello everybody, today we're going to be talking about a mystery behind the deaths of one of the most famous artists in human history, deaths? Vincent Van Gogh. Multiple? Vincent Van Gogh is an artist who truly needs no introduction. His use of curves and vibrant colors paved the way for abstract art as it is today. Yeah. And having made over 2,000 works of art in his life, 2,000 as a cornerstone in art history. However, what I didn't is know just we made that many about Van Gogh, if not more so, is the tragedy of the artist himself. Van Gogh lived a very troubled life, constantly battling ridicule from others as well as his own mental illness. And most believe this troubled life to be the cause of his death in July of 1890. However, in recent years, doctors, researchers, and historians have put together pieces of evidence that have arisen out of time to say maybe the historical record is false. 1890. I mean, it's funny how, how our view of history can be so compressed. I mean, like, I think a fair number of people watching this might have heard that Cleopatra, for example, lived closer to the modern day than she did to the building of the actual Great Pyramid. And yet she's, yet even though she was like a contemporary of like the Roman Empire, she still like grouped together with like ancient Egypt in a lot of cases, just because, you know, she was an Egyptian queen. Is there, is there like a female version of Pharaoh or was it just Pharaoh like unisex, or is Pharaoh like a unisex term? Um, I don't know. Not really important at the moment, but still, I mean, the fact that Vincent Van Gogh, like this, this, like this staple of art history, of like painting history, he died less than two decades before the First World War, and we, as like a society, think of the First World War, even if it has been over a century since it happened, it's still, you know, in modern history. But the fact that the that that they were so close kind of paints just paints haha -ha, quote but it just kind of like shows how close like a lot of things happened in history and it is really cool and that perhaps one of the most tragic deaths in all of art was actually a selfless sacrifice so today we're going to look at the story of Vincent van Gogh's what? death we're going to draw from the accounts of van Gogh himself and those around him whenever he died and then we're going to pull conflicting accounts and modern findings that lead me, as well as several other researchers, to believe that Van Gogh was killed by someone else's hand. So if that sounds interesting to you... Wait, I thought he was murdered is the thing. That's what um, happened. Oh, wait, no. Um, I'm trying to remember from Internet Historian's video. Didn't he say that one of the possible... One of his possible deaths was he was shot by, like, a couple of kids or something? Vincent Van Gogh. Of course, that's if you believe the evidence I have to say. If not, this is just another crazy random rant that I have, but that's all pretty, <laughs> you know, par for the course at this point. Now, as I said at the beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. Van Gogh needs no introduction. The short version of what's relevant for this video is that Van Gogh was a very tragic artist who was never able to experience the success that his name would eventually acquire. Mm -hmm. While he did make over 2,000 works of art in his life, the majority of them he would trade for a bottle of wine or just give away to people. As a matter of fact, really? several of the paintings that he would make and then send to his mother were thrown away by her. 
He was the youngest of six siblings and constantly disappointed his parents, picking up new jobs and moving from town to town frequently, meaning he was often ostracized by his family and the communities that he lived in. One of the only consistently positive relationships that he had in his life was with his older brother, Theo. Vincent and Theo were very close, and they wrote to each other frequently. As a matter of fact, for most of Vincent's life, whenever he was painting full-time, Theo financed his living expenses. And the majority of the details we know about Vincent's personal life come from the letters between him and Theo. Through these writings, we can see that Vincent was very troubled. He talked about the misery that he had in life, and how Theo was the only thing keeping him going. Opportunities and relations- Oh, God, I mean- I mean, already, I mean, the fact, I mean, I knew he, from the, from the, what little I knew of Van Gogh, like, before this, I, like, I knew he wasn't the most successful artist in his life. I mean, they, I mean, that was even, like, the plot of one Doctor Who episode, where they, like, brought him to the future to see that he would be, like, uh, like, uh, that his, like, talent would be recognized in the future, even if it was after his death. But I didn't know that that not only did his mother his mother throw away several of his paintings that he gave as gifts, but also the fact that he was like the the biggest disappointment in his family. Oh, okay. Relationships kept failing for Vincent, and he seemed to dive into this feeling of hopelessness. There's even a case to be made from several of his writings and paintings that he also suffered from some form of vertigo and epilepsy. And given his frequent stays in and out of asylums, it seems that Vincent rarely knew peace. This seemed to <laughs> yeah. culminate in 1888 when Van Gogh famously own ear. cut off his ear to give it to a woman he was interested in. Which, as you can imagine, this stunt landed him in an asylum. Which, fun fact, there is historical records to suggest that that didn't actually happen, and instead a friend of his who was practicing with the sword accidentally cut off his ear and Vincent made up the story to cover for him. Wait, really? There is? Okay. And here I thought one of the most widely known... Like facts about uh, Van Gogh would have been would be like indisputably true. And while I can't validate that, that sentiment is certainly foreshadowing for later. While in this asylum stay in 1888, Vincent would paint over 150 paintings, Jeez. along with some of his most famous, like Irises and Starry Night. When Vincent left the asylum, his brother Theo began showing several of these paintings at art shows in Paris. And for the first time in his life, Vincent was getting good reviews and people wanting to purchase his work. Oh, so wonderful. around this time of late 1889 and early 1890, Vincent moved to a city near Paris in northern France. I should also mention here that while I'm calling him Van Gogh, I know the correct pronunciation for it. Van Gogh. Like Gosh or Van Gogh or something along those lines. But I am a stupid American and will continue to mispronounce things with full misconfidence. I say that now as I'm about to horribly butcher the following French names. Wonderful. The town Vincent moved to was known as Aver sur Ois in northern France, and while there, he stayed in the Ravo Inn. I'm so sorry. And again, at this point in. I guess it's a side tangent with French. I mean, Silent X? <laughs> I, I know that, like, English has some has its issues, but I mean. French just doesn't care half the time. Things seemed to be going great for Vincent. Throughout June and July, he was painting at least one painting a day. And of course, really? that didn't fix the illness he was dealing with, but he seemed to be in better spirits than he had previously, which made the events of July the 27th all the more unexpected. Now, as I do with most of these conspiracy-esque videos, I will give the official account of what happened before I get into my nitpicks and issues with it. The Ravo Inn, where Vincent was living at the time, was a family-owned inn. And the okay. story of Vincent's death that is most commonly remembered and recorded throughout history comes from the Ravo's 13-year-old daughter, Adeline. So according to Adeline, these are the events that took place on July the 27th of 1890. It was typical for Vincent to come down and join the family for breakfast before he would leave with his easel and painting equipment to go paint some nature or town setting for the day, to which he would then return at sunset. 
and July the 27th okay. began like any other. Vincent ate with the family, then gathered his painting equipment and left the inn. However, despite his typical routine of returning just before sunset, Vincent was out well after dark. The family became worried about him until around 9 p.m. Vincent stumbled back into the inn. Suspiciously, Vincent didn't return with any of the equipment that he left with and had his coat wrapped around him while holding his stomach. Adeline's family asked if everything was okay, to which Vincent responded, no, but I have, before trailing off. He then stumbled up to his room and the family could hear him moaning for the next hour. Eventually, Adeline's father, the owner of the inn, decides to go upstairs and check on Vincent. When he comes to Vincent's side, Vincent removes his hand showing that there is a gunshot wound just below the rib cage. Okay. I, okay, well, I mean, I was going to say, like, how can you not, you know, go for help if you were literally shot instead of just lying in bed? But again, he, he, he was, like, suffering from some sort of mental illness. Oh, I, stuff like this, I just don't understand. Like, even with, even if, like, you're not firing at all cylinders upstairs, like, you'd think that, hey, I'm hurt and I'm most likely going to die, please help me so that I do not die, would be sort of, you know, standard procedure, even at, like, the most basic level. When the father asks what happened, Vincent says, I have wounded myself. The father sends for a physician, and eventually, Dr. Paul Gachette, a personal friend of Van Gogh, wounded himself. comes okay. to visit. Gachette takes notes of the wound that we'll talk about later, and dresses it the best he can, but overall considers it hopeless. According to Gachette, the bullet had traveled through his torso and wound up next to his spine without making an exit. Gachette said that it was a lost cause, and trying to dig it out would just speed up his death. So he bandaged it okay. and tried to make Vincent as comfortable as he could. Vincent lived through the night, and then the next night, a couple of gendarmes, which are effectively police officers at the time, questioned Van Gogh to try to figure out, you know, why he got shot. Again, at this point, Van Gogh had already told the innkeeper and those around that he had done it to himself. So whenever the gendarmes ask, did you try to hurt yourself? He says, I think so, before quickly saying, don't accuse anyone else. Which is oh. an odd way to answer that question. Okay. That morning, whenever what? the telegram office opened, the innkeeper sent a telegram to Vincent's brother, Theo. Theo arrived at once and spent the day by his brother's side. During that day, it seems that Vincent had peaceful conversations with his brother. Among his last words, according to Theo, was, I wish I could pass away like this. And while surrounded by his brother and the Raveau family, Vincent passed away in the early hours of July the 29th at around 1.30 a.m. At his funeral on July the 30th, several of his paintings were set across the room and several artists from Paris came to pay their respects. According to accounts that Adeline would later give, during his final hours, Van Gogh said that he had left to go to the wheat fields outside of the town in order to paint, and that while he was there in the wheat field, he injured himself before passing out waking up several hours later after dark, making his way down the mile-long trek back to the inn before dying over a day later. So but it seems to- But how? Like, I, did he have a gun? Because, you know, that's kind of a necessary part of having a gunshot wound. Most that the tragedy- Unless he threw a paper shot himself really quickly. ...throughout his life led to his eventual death. Or did it? See, everything yeah. I just said comes from the testament of Van Gogh as he lay dying, as well as a 13-year-old girl who would recount the story decades later. That is ignoring the accounts of several locals and witnesses at the time, including oh, was his it? own brother, as well as the physical evidence of what happened that July evening. So let's get into it. And as I lay out the evidence, okay. I want to emphasize that I don't think any one piece of this is declarative that it was a murder. But wait till you hear all the individual pieces of circumstantial evidence for why I think it was, you know, evidence, evidence. For one, let's start with the actual moment of the gunshot itself. There's never a full-blown medical autopsy conducted on Van Gogh, you know, being in... The French countryside in 1890, <laughs> those weren't really commonplace. Yeah. However, the physician took very detailed notes. 
According to his report, and it's corroborated with the witnesses who were there, the gunshot had entered, this is going to be awkward to stand for camera, the gunshot had entered just below the rib cage on Vincent's left side, and the bullet curved across his body, winding up next to his spine on the right side. Again, never making an okay. exit from his torso. Which I don't think I have to tell you, if you are attempting a fatal wound, that's a really weird way to go about it. And... And also, just on top of that, I mean, I mean, granted, 1850, so, I mean, a gun, a gun is a gun still. You'd expect, like, if he did it himself, he'd have, like, the gun here if it was a pistol or, like, a rifle or something. I mean, that would still have enough energy, even with it going through the body, to exit the other side, especially at literally point-blank range. Unless he was trying some, like, new way of painting using a gun, I don't think that's really, that, that really works. Like, yeah, it was the 1890s, but they had an understanding of where organs are. So to instead go completely under the rib cage, missing all bones and vital organs, just seems odd. Furthermore, it's almost certain that Van Gogh was right-handed due to several of the self-portraits that he made of himself. And while, obviously, it's not impossible to use your non-dominant hand, it's just another weird note. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, it's believed by many that Van Gogh died due to immediate infection he incurred because of the wound rather than blood loss, which explains taking over a day to actually die. On top yeah, of that, okay. Van Gogh's description of the shot itself doesn't make any sense. Dr. Irv Arnberg, the author of Killing Vincent, has been a longtime proponent for the idea that Vincent didn't do it. Part of his evidence for yeah, this doesn't is make sense. the nature of the injury itself. Arnberg proposes that if Vincent was to do it, he would most likely use a La Fachot pinfire revolver. Revolvers were very rare in France around this time, so if there was one to be in the town, it would most likely be a La Fachot. There was also a very weathered one found in a field outside of the town that some think might have been the weapon that Vincent used. But there's a lot okay. of guns found in Western Europe countryside, so it doesn't really prove it. <laughs> yeah. But nevertheless, the Lafa shows the most likely candidate. That revolver, as well as pretty much every other revolver at the time, used a black powder cartridge. Modern gunpowder, or smokeless powder, was very rare around this time, and nearly every firearm in France would have been using black powder. Black powder, as anyone who's worked with it can tell you, is much messier than modern gunpowder. A lot it of smoke, behind a lot ton of, residue. of residue that can lead to burns and even ignite after it's come out of the barrel. People who are shot at point blank range by black powder firearms have these very charred bullet wounds that are covered with these deep powder burns. No. To demonstrate this, Dr. Arnberg took one of these revolvers and shot various pieces of ballistic gel that were covered in clothing. As you can see, the black powder is so volatile that it sets the cotton shirt on fire whenever he fires into it, as well as leaving behind severe powder burns. As mentioned earlier, the attending physician for Vincent took very detailed notes. In the notes, the doctor said that the wound was a pea hole sized wound with concentric rings of purple and brown emanating out from the wound. So the doctor took notes what? to mention the size of the bullet wound and the bruising rings around the wound itself, but had no mention of powder burns, which there definitely would be. Furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, the bullet never exited his body, which could happen up close, but more than likely if you were holding a barrel up to you, it would go all the way through. What was that? I literally just said that. lead Dr. Arnberg, as well as many others, to believe that he was shot from a distance. Mm -hmm. That would explain the bullet not going all the way through and the lack of powder burns. Furthermore, the yeah. idea that Vincent would fire once and then go to sleep for a while and then wake up and then walk over a mile through the fields back to town is hard to swallow at least. Yeah. It would have been a long hike over rough terrain for a badly wounded man. How did he climb through these uh, vast wheat fields and down the escarpment into the town? It's also, like I mentioned earlier, revolvers were very rare at the time with only the higher members of society having them. Yeah, so how would Van Gogh, a man who was, you know, up until recently very poor and only just starting to get his paintings actually bought by people, how would he have the money to buy, like, a weapon like that? 
and no one reported one being missing or admitted to giving one to Vincent. Furthermore, after Vincent was shot, several locals and police went to the location where it supposedly happened. And despite the entire town investigating, they can never find the gun or any of Vincent's painting equipment. On top of that, Vincent's brother Theo also thought it didn't make sense. He Again, was astounded it doesn't. by this because according to him and everything Vincent had told them, Vincent was strongly against self-harm. Yes, he was very sad and yes, he was depressed. And I understand that mental illness can push you to things that you wouldn't do otherwise. But Vincent would commonly scoff at the concept, calling it sinful and a moral wrong. In his younger years, Vincent had studied to be a Methodist pastor and throughout all Wait, of his really? writings seemed to continue his belief in God and Christianity. And it seemed uncharacteristic okay. to Theo that, especially since things had been going better over the past year, that Vincent would resort to that now when he hadn't before. Furthermore, Vincent never wrote any kind of a note. Even more so, on his desk, whenever he lay dying, there were several unfinished letters that he was writing to personal friends and acquaintances. Some historians have said that a note was found in Vince's coat pocket, but that note was a draft of a letter that he had written earlier in the week to Theo. So it certainly wasn't any kind of final goodbye and was instead okay. just a normal letter that Vincent normally wrote. And for a guy who wrote everything and talked to people constantly, it seems weird that he wouldn't write down anything, especially to his brother. On yeah, top of that, definitely. Several historians who propose the historically accepted account of his death point to a fight that Theo and Vincent had a couple weeks earlier as the reason for it. This fight, according to Theo, was over the fact that Theo wanted to start a new business and perhaps Vincent felt that he was a burden to his brother. However, according to Theo, it was more so just Vincent worried about his brother's future endeavors and they didn't end on terrible terms. So again, not really an excuse for what happened, especially if, you know, Vincent was continuing to write friendly letters to him. The fallout couldn't have been that bad. Yeah, so you think. It doesn't make any sense for Vincent to resort to that if the logistics of the shot itself and the fact that no evidence was ever found don't make any sense, then who killed him? Well, for our proposed answer for that, look to a book titled Van Gogh, The Life. Okay. The authors, Nefay and Smith, also didn't believe Vincent to be responsible. So instead, they began to put together historical evidence and propose a new theory. That theory follows an individual named Rene Secretan. As I mentioned earlier, Van Gogh was seen as an outsider and constantly mocked by the community around him. Yeah, of a large course. part of that mocking was at the hand of 16-year-old Rene and his friends. Van Gogh was seen as a weird guy. So right, so this is the part that the historian was talking about. Him. They would do things like pour salt in his coffee, place snakes inside of his art equipment, and put chili pepper on the end of his paintbrush so whenever he went to lick it, he would get chili pepper in his mouth. Oh, come well, on. That's actually kind of clever. I support it. Obviously <sighs> again, kids are monsters, aren't they? Though then again, this kid also, he sounds like he's... Yeah, a bit troubled himself. Obviously not to, you know, a struggling, mentally ill artist who is dealing with a lot of other issues in life, but as like a joke on your friend who paints sometimes, 10 out of 10. Years later, Rene was interviewed regarding Van Gogh, which again gives more credibility to this theory. And Rene said, our favorite game was making him angry, which was easy. Now, Rene had an older brother right. by the name of Gaston. And from all accounts, Gaston and Vincent were close friends. Gaston had questions about artistry and what it was like to be a painter. And Vincent would enjoy the company and the two would often share meals together. While in the background, Gaston's younger brother, Rene, and Rene's friends would torment Vincent. According to several yeah, that accounts, sounds wonderful. including Rene's own, when Rene was again around 16 years old, he went to Paris and watched a show of Buffalo Bill. Being inspired by this cowboy aesthetic, Rene bought himself a cowboy hat and cowboy duds. Well, the Wait, really? This untitled sketch by Vincent. They believe it actually shows Rene Secretan decked out as Buffalo Bill. Van Gogh, either unable to pronounce Buffalo Bill or mocking Rene, began to refer to him as Buffalo Pill. Oh, God. And don't. Please don't, please don't tell me that this, that he might have gotten so angry at this, uh, at this mocking, if it actually was mocking, that he ended up shooting him. Uh. 
which apparently angered Renee and is incredibly hilarious. Because think about it, Renee and these kids have tormented Van Gogh for a year at this point. And Van Gogh just casually says, Puffalo pill, and it just sets the kids off. Uh, it just goes to show some people can uh, can give, but they can't take. Among the cowboy attributes that Puffalo Pill had bought was an expensive 380 caliber revolver. Renee and Gaston's family, the Secretans, had a lot of money and had a large property outside of the village where Van Gogh would frequently paint. Mm -hmm. According to several witnesses that day who saw Van Gogh as he was leaving town, he was not walking towards the wheat fields. He was instead walking the opposite direction towards the Secretan property, specifically along an area where Rene and his friends would constantly go fishing. And on July the 27th, oh, no. a local said that he heard a gunshot not in the wheat fields, but just outside of the village on the opposite side of town. So perhaps Van Gogh was traveling to a area that he would frequently paint at, whenever he came across Rene and his friends, or perhaps Rene and his brother, or just Rene himself. From there, it could be imagined that perhaps Rene was goofing off and being a kid playing with a gun and accidentally fired. Perhaps they had a verbal argument and Rene was trying to scare Vincent and either fired next to him or thought the gun was unloaded. But regardless of specific circumstances, it's possible that the 16-year-old Rene shot Vincent. From there, Vincent stumbles back to the inn, and in an effort to not ruin the life of a young boy and his friend's younger brother, he says that he did it himself. While lying and instead saying he was heading for the wheat fields in the opposite direction. Rene or Gaston could have hidden or destroyed Vincent's art equipment, and that would also explain why the art equipment and the gun was never found. And furthermore, the day after Vincent was shot, Rene, Gaston, and their father left town. They left town for several weeks, and according to locals, whenever they returned, Rene, who had previously kept a gun at his hip for months, quit carrying it for some reason. Really? Rene was interviewed in 1956, a year before he died, because, you know, this sounds like a lot of evidence pointing towards him. And whenever he was asked about what happened to the gun specifically, Rene said that Vincent had stolen it from him some time before his death. However, if that right. were true, that would mean the young Rene had his favorite gun stolen by someone that he hated and just decided to never tell anyone. That would explain the lack of physical evidence with the location where Vincent claimed that it happened, as well as the idea that he hiked over a mile through the countryside with a bullet hole in him to get back to the inn. That would explain the odd location and physics of the gunshot that injured him. And that would even explain his confused response whenever they asked him of the situation, and he said he thinks he did it. And to top it all off, in the 1930s, whenever art historians were visiting the village in order to paint a story of Vincent's life, they began to ask the locals of his death, and everyone said, oh, well, Vincent. Well, he was killed by a group of kids who were messing around, but decided to keep their identity secret as to not get them in trouble. And by that mm. point, the account had almost been solidified that Vincent was the one responsible. And as the historians would tell the locals, they'd say, no, it's always been the story that a bunch of kids did it, and Vincent was just being a good Samaritan in his final hours. And while a lot of people continuously portray this idea of Vincent just being a tortured artist who eventually let the torturing get the best of him, I see this as such a beautiful picture. Because yes, without a doubt, Vincent struggled a lot in his life. And he faced challenges that most of us will hopefully never have to. But yeah. the idea that despite all that suffering, despite all that circumstance that he had to deal with, in his final hours... He didn't want some kids to get in trouble. Kids who otherwise he had this rivalry and potential hatred of is such a beautiful idea. Six months after Vincent's death, his brother Theo would pass away due to health complications. Oh. And Theo's wife would eventually have Theo buried next to Vincent. And while he would never see the fruits of his labor on this side of eternity, yeah. Vincent went on to be remembered as one of the most important figures in art history. His painting, The Portrait of Dr. Paul Gachette, which if you'll remember is the doctor who attended to him at his deathbed, sold in 1990 for $83 million. Keep in mind, this is the man who had trouble trading his paintings for a bottle of wine. 
Before yeah. his burial, there was a gathering at the Ravu Inn to remember Vincent. Sunflowers, of course. And on the walls, some of his Auvergne paintings. The wheat fields. The town hall. A portrait of Adeline Ravu, the teenager who served dinner every night to the troubled man who lived in the tiny room upstairs. The man who once wrote, As a painter, I will never amount to anything important. I am absolutely sure of it. And I understand when it comes to historical Jeez. accounts like this, not everything was as well recorded as we would like it to be. Yeah. Not everything was, you know, cited in a way that we can definitively say what the truth is or isn't. But when taking all of the physical evidence and the accounts that I mentioned and then comparing them against the story of a girl who was 13 years old at the time, as well as the words of Vincent as he lay dying, I like to think that this holds more weight. Because while, yes, Vincent suffered and while his story was tragic, there was so much beauty and elegance that he managed to pull out of that tragedy. And perhaps if I'm right about these theories, then there's a beauty and elegance in his selflessness at the end. Or you think that I'm absolutely insane and this is just another one of no, my No, that's that's that theories. sounds a lot and more at this plausible. Point, I can't tell the difference. So good on you. But regardless if you think I'm crazy or not, which I almost certainly am, but about this topic in particular, that's totally fine because you're still here and you're still watching and I just want to say thank you for watching. But really, thank you all for watching. Thank you for supporting and sticking around. It means the world. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. I believe that should do. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, yeah, I mean... I had no idea there were actual conspiracy theories around his death. I had, again, I didn't know he died via gunshot or anything like that. I, uh, I mean, of course, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I had heard that, that he had had a hard life, but I mean, just, that is so sad. So yeah, that's going to be it for now. So yeah, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will lead to my let's play of the day. And with all that out of the way, I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not. And I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.